Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Um, welcome, and thank you for joining us um, this evening. My name is Nayun Zhang. I'm an associate lecturer here at the Courtauld, and, um, and it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the two speakers this evening. Um, Nicholas Hirsch, um, maybe you would like to shape, wave friendly, uh, Nicholas Hirsch. <laughs> is a Frankfurt-based um, architect and co-founder of EFLUX Architecture. He was the director of Stadtschüler Academy in Frankfurt and previously taught at um, the Architectural Association in London and University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and the, the Institute of Applied Theatre Studies in Gießen University. Um, his project include the award-winning Dresden Synagogue and um, Do We Dream Under the Same Sky for Art Basel in 2016. And he curated numerous um, exhibitions at Portica's Kunsthalle and many others, um, and um, which include Folly for the Gwangju Biennale and also the Real DMZ project in 2014. Um, he is the author author of the book On Boundaries, published in 2007, and co-author of many publications such as um, Track 17, Institution Building, Folly, and Superhumanity. And Professor Kang Park is professor of um, public culture and speculative design in the Department of, Department of Visual Arts and University of California, San Diego. He was the founding director of Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York and the International Center for Urban Ecology in Detroit and the Centrala Foundation for Future Cities in Rotterdam. And um, he was also a curator of the Gwangju Biennale in 1997 and the artistic director and chief curator of, of Anyang Public Art Project 2010 in Korea. And he is the author of Urban Ecology, Detroit and Beyond, published in 2005, and Imagining Eurasia, Visualizing Contemporary History, published um, this year. So both of them have worked closely with the Real DMZ um, project, which is a contemporary um, art and research project on the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between um, South and North Korea. Um, it was founded in 2012 by curator Sun Jung Kim, and they have curated numerous exhibitions um, so far. Um, so I'd like to flag a touring exhibition um, co-curated by the Real DMZ Project and the Korean Culture Center, UK, that is actually currently on at London's um, um, Korean Culture Center, which is located in, in Strand. Um, so the, the exhibition will be on until 23rd of November, so I truly recommend, if you haven't seen it yet, that you visit it. And in relation to this exhibition, there are two very interesting film screening events that are taking place this uh, weekend. The first one is Pia Gol, which is a rare film on leftist leftist uh, partisan fighters made in um, um, 1955, right after uh, the Korean War ended. And the other one is Yu Sun Mi's essay films that explore the repressed memories of the war that continue to haunt and define the Korean um, peninsula. So please check our London Korean Film Festival's website for further information. And finally, I'd like to add, uh, say a few words of thanks. So this event is organized as a part of Asian Art in London 2019, and it was co-organized by the Courtauld um, Asia Research Cluster and the K Korean Culture Center UK. And I'd like to thank everyone at the Korean Culture Center, especially um, curator Jamin Cha, who made this event possible. And I'd also like to thank um, Korean Foundation for International Culture Exchange for their um, generous support. So our format for um, this evening is part presentations and part um, conversations. So the first part, first hour or so uh, will be the presentation. So um, Professor Kyung Park will deliver his um, presentation first and then Nicholas Hirsch will give his presentation. And for the following half an hour or so, um, the two speakers will have a conversation based on their um, presentations. And after their discussion, hopefully there will be some time for um, questions from the floor as well. Um, and this will be followed by a drinks reception, so um, where we could continue our, our um, discussion. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kyung Park. Okay. Um, 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Korean Culture Center, to invite me here to speak about uh, DMZ. Um, to make one clarification, uh, I, I was not involved in real DMZ. Uh, Nicholas was very involved in real DMZ. Uh, but I think that uh, the reason for me being here was because of the project uh, that I did uh, in 1998. Uh, in storefront for art and architecture that was mentioned where it was uh, directing. And that was about the DMZ, it was called Project DMZ. And uh, uh, why was, uh, uh, what was the reason for me to do that project, as you can see here, uh, is that, that at that period, uh, there was a lot of discussion about how that, let's say, fairly, fairly optimistic discussion about demilitarization throughout the world. There was even this uh, talk in Washington, D.C., uh, so-called peace dividend. And uh, uh, the, meaning of what, the meaning of that, those two uh, key words, not particularly clear, but I could just generally say that uh, in many of people's optimistic view that the efforts and the interest and the finance that's spent on military could be used for peaceful means, right? right. So the idea of conversion of that into something that is more humanistic, in, let's say, uh, was very much in, in the air. And uh, I think the, that's the reason why the Project DMZ came about. And we also have to think about uh, that the Berlin, Berlin Wall came down in 1989. And so there was a period of time worldwide there was a hopeful sign for, uh, let's say, the end of certain amount of militarism, right? And uh, so how do I move this here, this way? Right, so Storefront, uh, the place that I ran for, uh, I founded in 1982, and I directed it until 1998, uh, 90, yeah, 98. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, very fondly was to make a newsprint okay, uh, for our poster of our, all our exhibitions. But it also was a double page, uh, quite large, like a standard newspaper. Uh, I had always put a lot of information. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, we did that because it was actually a very cheap way to print something, the cheapest way. And uh, so you can see here, for example, the announcement of the, for the exhibition of Project DMZ. And of course, you will see same images over and over again, like Bridge of No Return, the DMZ, uh, the wall, meeting of the North and South uh, at the Panmunjom table. These are kind of iconic, typical media political image of the DMC that we're all familiar with. Perhaps, you know, kind of sick and tired of that idea. The project was essentially uh, kind of, I framed it as a way of, look, uh, what if that, uh, I'm not sure, you know, it's been so long ago, I haven't really looked back carefully about what was um, uh, in the prints, but, was imagining what if the, the conflict between North and South was no longer uh, present, then what would you do with the DMC, right? Uh, so it was an idea, one way to see for a new function in that space, but also the idea that the new function proposed, imagine, could perhaps incite some peaceful directions between two countries, right? And so, uh, Storefront, uh, we did a lot of these kind of projects that were theoretical idea issues projects, like this, or at that time in New York, homeless at home was a, homeless was a big issue in 1980s, as is beginning to be again. Uh, or Atlas project, like what to do with abandoned ICBM missile bases, uh, or other things that are more critical about you know, extension of Whitney by postmodern architect, bad one, Michael Graves, or tilted art controversy with Richard Serra and uh, community or 
the office worker opposition to it and so forth. Uh, so, you know, they were made into project. We invited people to participate. Uh, there were no prizes. Uh, uh, people just were attracted by the ideas of it. And surprisingly, we get returns from very well-known people spend their own time at you know low cost, uh, and they send the work, and then you know we don't give any prizes and like that. So here's an example: uh, Paul Virilio, working with French architect group Avant Travaux, they proposed the idea of building an international airport in DMZ. Okay. So it's about I think idea of sharing two sides sharing something together, then, you know, of course, you know, it's even uh, uh, historically manifested in the, uh, the Gengangsan uh, uh, tourist uh, uh, sites as uh, on one way. The other was the Gyeongsang industrial complex where two sides mutually uh, work together. Uh, and so I think the idea is similar. Here's the case where uh, the late architect Levius Woods, who was a fascinating architect who basically never built anything, but he designed and drew fantastic landscape that is imaginations about <coughs> architecture and cities and society ultimately. Uh, in fact, uh, some of his work was copied by, uh, what's that? Oh, God. Alien, right, the movie Alien. Uh, one of his alien birds, he ended up suing them and he, got, he won the case, got some money from Hollywood. Uh, and so he made this idea about the DMZ could become uh, uh, taking the contours of the landscape, uh, Korea being very mountainous, and turned into this kind of city within, embedded in the nature, uh, almost integral with topography of the landscape. Um, of course, uh, Namjoon Pipe, uh, you know, proposed this simple idea about turning into a tiger farm to uh, eat up the Japanese uh, tourist. Okay, now that's kind of like kind of strange. Uh, I don't know how to say that word. Hyper logical or something like that, where you can't really decide. Who is the real enemy in this case? You know, right? I guess both are enemies. Enemies eating each other up. So, it's, and this is uh, Park Iso. Uh, he uh, was a friend who lived. I knew him when he lived in also in New York at the time. Uh, he ran a, a exhibition space, alternate space called. Uh, God, I forget the name uh, now. Uh, Anyway, it'll come to me later. And uh, his idea was he sent a kind of this amulet to six leaders. I'm not actually sure he actually did it, never told me. But it would be sort of like a powder of something that you, like a medicine, a ground up medicine. And he wrote a letter to them asking them, if you put this powder into your favorite drink or wine or something, and you all drank it together, right? then the unification of Korea would become true. Okay. Of course, it was probably poisonous, you know, uh, really intended to kill them. That's just my curatorial uh, 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 observation. Come on in. And, um, and other uh, people made projects like two burners, you know, electric burner, hot plates, they call it in the US or like to sound devices, uh, uh, calling out random uh, uh, political propaganda from both sides. I think it's kind of a takeoff from the sound warfare they had at DMZ where each side was blasting you know, music or noise to each other, right? That became sort of like psychological propaganda warfare which reminds me a story, rumors, I don't know if it's true about the flags, how big the flags got, right? Both sides, is that true? That one day they were meeting at the table in Panmunjom, you saw the pictures, right? Table, two sides sitting together, and they had small little flags on the table, and one day one side brought a bigger table, bigger flag uh, on the table, and then the next meeting, 
they brought, the other side brought a bigger flag, not on the table, but on the floor. Right? <laughs> and then the next time, a bigger flag appeared outside the building. And then so on, so on. It kind of like got, it's like Dr. Sue's story, right? Like which side of the bread that you put your uh, peanut butter on, on the top or the bottom side, right? Um, you know, and the flag now is like giant pole of like 150 meter tall, and you can see it even from Shanghai or Beijing. Uh, so, and then you have these things like, you know, razor wire, barbed wire, mirror, crack, you know, danger, uh, and other projects were like sightings, sighting through each other. Uh, through barriers. Uh, other on the top is more like building towers to see over DMZs to see each other. So there was idea of uh, attraction to seeing each other, right? Having eye-to-eye -eye contact or something like that uh, because there's so many, I, so many sense of invisibility between two sides, right? Right. Uh, not only that from the south side, we don't really know. It's not just the north side doesn't know what kind of opulence and uh, extraordinary wealth and incredible K-pop culture in the south. The, we, we don't know what's going on in north, you know, you know, concentration camp, death camp, or whatever, right? So, but my DMZ project was not the only one. In fact, um, there was a very good presentation by uh, Yang Yu Shim, uh, who kind of had a history of all different projects over time. Uh, and you know, it's a kind of self-exploratory if you can read it. And these were mostly uh, uh, by architects, uh, at least uh, in his uh, archival collection. And so he shows that the fact that the Space Magazine, the most important architectural magazine in Korea for decades, was started by uh, the most famous Korean architect, uh, Kim Suga. In some, I, I find his work to be like, some are good and some of them are pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but he was very kind of polemical, uh, uh, very uh, influential figure, and the one thing he did that was very successful was this magazine called Space Magazine. And in that Space Magazine, you will find a lot of projects that they have sponsored or they have published, uh, pu uh, some independent project people have done on their own with different organizations. And uh, so it's, you know, it's also kind of asking questions about the, the boundary issues, right? And as you can see here, that uh, picture on uh, image uh, on the, your left is the famous Park Jung Yi. He's the, the um, 18 years of military dictatorship after coup in 1961, is that right? Yeah, something like that. And he was assassinated. Uh, and on the second or maybe even third or fourth attempt, one of the assassination attempts actually killed his wife, who was very popular among Koreans. And the one uh, under his right is the last military, official military dictatorship because he was a soldier. Jeon uh, do who was the uh, 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 president uh, at the time of the Guangzhou uprise massacre in 1980. So that was his downfall in terms of how he was removed uh, from political uh, power. So there was projects like this one where, you know, it's a basically tourist theme park proposal with a lake in the middle and different amenities around it. Let's say rather kind of more traditional style, but one can imagine that it's not that different as an idea as the Gunggangsan uh, uh, tourist uh, resort uh, site, maybe called, because it has many different things. 
uh, basically was done by Hyundai Corporation, the, the leader of Hyundai uh, uh, idea. Uh, and then you also know that, that people, you know, that the fame to DMZ is that it's the, you know, one of the most naturally inhabited place, I'm not sure in the world, but you know, that's probably exaggeration, but that because, because humans are not present, that the nature thrives and exists in its purest form, probably more than if you went to a zoo, or if you went to, definitely, even went to natural uh, reserve, preserved areas, right? And uh, the irony of this is that, that, uh, that at the most uh, heavily, one of the most heavily military zone in the world, right? I mean, there is definitely, I'm pretty sure there's nuclear weapon in South Korea, you know, at least tactical nuclear weapons, okay? Which means that they can be shot out of the cannon, sort of more like, right? Not dropped off the bomb or missiles. But that the, uh, 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 similar to, let's say, uh, what would be around Israel, for example, right? Uh, in the in the highly most highly concentration of the meaning and material for death is where life of other than ourselves can actually thrive. So I think it is a kind of something that uh, a theorist or historians could really dig very deeply into this contradiction and would have a very fruitful career from that, not me. Uh, then, you know, there's other projects like this where uh, there was idea of connecting infrastructurally, okay? And which is also the idea of that uh, South Koreans really dream about. In fact, you know, the last uh, the impeached, imprisoned president, Park geun who is the daughter of the great dictator Park jung that I mentioned, you saw a picture. In fact, Park jung is a kind of like Ara Turk of Korea, you would say. You know, one that really is a founder of the nation of South Korea, literally, in a sense. Uh, he still has strong supporters from the older generation, people like me, who, you know, waves the flags around. You know, right now there's a battle between the party for the Korean flags and then party of the uh, candles, right? Uh, the two instruments used by oppositional uh, uh, political mind in the demonstrations in the last two years, so to speak. So infrastructure is one of them. And that is like, because um, South Korea is basically an island because of North Korea. It's not connected to the whole entire Eurasia continent. You cannot connect to Russia or China by land. Now with all the projects like New Silk Road project that Xi Jinping has pushing, been pushing since 2014 of connecting Asia, East Asia with Europe and elsewhere, including to you know, Latin America, to, you know, Vladimir Putin proposing to build a bridge across Bering Strait, all this, right? Infrastructure is vital. And so it makes sense that at some point somebody would come up with that kind of idea. And Bakunes also talked about those ideas. And, uh, and I'm sure that others would, is that connecting uh, infrastructurally to Eurasian continent would be uh, economic, uh, the very important uh, 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 idea, and uh, I actually don't know what this is about. Uh, it related to Gwangju Biennale, but maybe uh, Gwangju Uprise. And uh, the, there are other projects that were more about the cultural notions, uh, and uh, artists like Ivan. Uh, during the Olympic uh, poster, uh, 1988. And I, this kind of reminds me of that, yes, when I did the project TMZ, um, they were all, participants were, none of them were Koreans living in Korea. 
American. Why is that? Well, I went to Korea. I, I've been living in the United States since I immigrated to the U.S. in 1967, 52 years ago already. Um, so uh, so I, I thought about, yeah, you know, I need to go to Korea if I can get Koreans to participate, right? So I went to Korea. This was just before Olympic 88. And this is also a time when the kind of the, uh, the climax of anti, um, I forgot to set up my timing here, uh, anti-military uh, uh, dictatorship. How am I doing with time? Okay, how much do I have? 15? Okay. Um, and uh, uh, let me set this up because before I forget. Okay, timer. Okay. And uh, uh, right, I went, it, it was a time when the, the uh, anti dictatorship movement was at its height, okay, from 1980s. I mean, you're talking about millions of, sometimes millions of people on the street. And it was extremely violent. You know, it was like, like war happening, you know. And uh, uh, so I went to talk to, uh, I was recommended to speak to one very important figure, uh, Sun Won Kyung. I don't know if you know him. Uh, he's, a, he's been a long professor, but he's also been a very important director, curator, things like that. Like, in fact, I think it was artist director for Gwangju Biennale in 2002 or something like that. So, uh, so I went to see, uh, I met him and, uh, and I asked him about, you know, can, would you like to participate in uh, this project and then help me to connect with your, you know, uh, network of people. And basically, he said no. <laughs> okay, uh, why? Because there was three things that uh, that uh, uh, I found out later that the movement was against. One was that, or four. One was that it was obviously against military dictatorship. Two, it was for pro unification at that time. Okay, now people, most people are against unification in Korea. Um, South Korea, that is. Uh, and uh, third was that they were anti-American. <laughs> they don't want to do anything to do with anything happening in America, right? So, um, and you have to kind of understand maybe that thinking is like this, you know, that uh, how did the, uh, you know, Korea was divided uh, after the so-called Second War, World War, or Pacific War. Uh, into 38 parallel, right? right. And uh, uh, how was that 38 parallel division was made? Uh, the Russia, Russians were coming down from north, uh, just like Russians were coming down north in, in Europe, right? And so uh, the idea was that Americans thought that the Russians were just take up the whole Korean Peninsula. And so they proposed counter and uh, so at that time, some junior uh, uh, State Department figure who later became Secretary of State, one of the longest serving Secretary of State under Eisenhower, uh, who's next? Anyway, Dean Rusk was a young guy and with another person, I can't remember his name. They, they looked at National Geographic magazine and they saw a 38 parallel line uh, looks like it divides Korea into roughly equal half. Right? And keep Seoul, the capital, on the south side. Right? And propose to Russians that let's do this, let's divide Korea in half. Right? And to their surprise, Russians accepted it. Right? It became part of the proposal number one, I think, or sorry, 1947. It was basically kind of agreement between 1945, I'm sorry, uh, agreement with Japanese surrendering to the United States. And it was included in that. So that's how the country was divided. Of course, you know the story, 1950 to 53, Korean War started, and then it ended up being in this about the same line, but it was more, shall I say, like a better word, natural outline, 
uh, you know, trench war at last three years of the Korean War defined that eventual. Uh, but the division of the t Korea explains basically what is the current situation as well, uh, which maybe I should talk about a little bit later. But anyway, maybe I should move a little bit faster. OK, there's this idea about building future city, you know, uh, perhaps influenced by what is going on at that time in South Korea, mega real estate developments, you know, that everybody was buying their properties, uh, like we call Chegebar, which Mauricio remember, you know, that project and Anyang project. So there were a lot of different projects that uh, uh, and, and similar to like uh, infrastructure or uh, entertainment, uh, steam park. But another thing that I think is interesting is another project here, but again by artist uh, Ivan, is that a performance uh, idea. I didn't really look through this carefully, but the idea of doing performance and the uh, sort of, uh, you know, maybe somewhat could be shamanistic or contemporary performance, let's say. Uh, where you do a ritual on the, uh, the top of Mount Baekdu San, which is the, uh, the tallest mountain in Korea, but it also has this huge water uh, lake uh, crater on the top, uh, which is quite deep, actually. It's like, I don't know, it's like 250 meters deep or something like that. And uh, then you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's on the border with China. Uh, anyway, I wrote a, a story uh, here in uh, nine, 2014, uh, uh, Venice Biennale Korean Pavilion Project, which was curated by uh, Jo Min Suk and Be Hyung Min, I believe. And uh, I wrote a story about how the Korea was Unified. It was a fictional story, and uh, it was only published in English, in not in Korean, because they were not sure that it would be the right idea to actually uh, print it in Korean. <laughs> Which I'm not sure, you know, if everybody can translate, whatever. But it was a story about how the, the, uh, Korea, uh, the very, both North and South Korean government used DMZ as a way of legitimizing their political power. And they conspired with each other to create tensions at DMZ in order to support their, uh, uh, I mean, their political regime, right? And then people found out about it, and basically uh, the reaction was that they mistrust both the South side and the North side, mistrusted their own government uh, for different reasons, but. Uh, people at that time was also, in South Korea particularly, was interested in rural migration, some younger generations or middle-aged people uh, running away from the city. So I imagine that there was a kind of a de occupied DMZ movement starting to flow, that land was free, and then they found out all these mines were not really there. They were all just propagandas. And so people started moving there, and then both from north and south. The idea was that if there was no politics, if it was left up to people, then people would get together. Right? So it's the politics that keep us separated. Right? Mm. So people moved in, and then it got more and more successful, maybe like those utopian city projects you saw before. And then it just grew and grew. And then so people pushed up north, people pushed south. And then after 60 some years later, who knows? about amount of time the Korea was separated. Finally, the people reached the top of Baekdu Mountain and the, and the bottom in Jeju Island and Halat Mountain. Also, is a crater, volcanic crater with a lake inside. There are two, with the two legends of the, uh, the birth of Korean people come from each, both of those places. Occupy the same time, at the end, the word South Korea, North Korea, became a non-existent in Korean literature and history, including the government expired. Both government expired, OK? So that was the idea. So uh, and then, then I made recently, uh, I had this project uh, in Korea. And 
Asian Culture Center in Guangzhou. And one of the projects that I did was to make uh, a game of unification. Okay. Uh, inspired by Game of Thrones, maybe. <laughs> and uh, the three card game, 36 cards, uh, one side maps of conflicts abstracted all around the world. The other side is image of North and South uh, Pyongyang and Seoul. With, <coughs> with Korean alphabets printed on. And three players, three colors, the most popular colors of flags around the world. And one is Korean player, one is North Korean, uh, South Korean players. Uh, one representing North Korean players, one representing international player, right? And the objective is that because you can see the alphabets, that North and South try to uh, spell out Tongil, which is word unification in six alphabet, and uh, six characters, and uh, uh, the international player, what, is, what does international player try to do? Huh? Mess it up. Yes, mess it up. <laughs> exactly. Right. That never they could spell the word together unification. Right? <laughs> okay. So that's a 36 cards. And so in the image, uh, there is this image here. For example, um, um, those are images. But I want to uh, update, but not quite updated yet, uh, uh, new uh, fiction. Uh, update about that, the one that I told you before. So uh, no one imagined that this could happen, but it did. Korea is one again. Well, not exactly. The two Koreas are still separate, but now as the confederation of Koreas. The DMZ is still there along the same line, but in the most stunning development in the history of world politics, North and South Korea agreed and actually combined their military forces into one single one. And so did their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The devastating three-term presidency of Donald Trump is now a distant memory, uh, as well as the uh, ongoing civil war. As, and, uh, um, uh, okay. Raised a uh, uh, civil war in America as the Freedom Caucus predicted and wanted it and raises on without the end in sight. Not divided neatly along the Mason Dixon line, this one is even more organized than the breakup of Yugoslavia, like a shrapnel from contorted gerrymandering of religious, political, and racial device that explodes from sea to sea. With the bully of the six-party talks absent, which six-party talk was what was going on, uh, mostly uh, uh, represented by Russia, China, United States, Japan, and North and South Korea. Uh, six-party talks absent, the situation of Korea is back to the end of Joseon Dynasty with Japan, China, Russia vying for an imperial land bridge between the continents and the Pacifics. Remembering how Joseon ended, then the colonization and division of Korea, ROK and DPRK, uh, South Korea, Republic of Korea, and Democratic Republic, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, saw common interest in their existential cooperation. Of course, this was already happening when Trump pushed hard against Russia and China, giving a host of reasons for ROK and DPRK to reconnect. Like the, th the three system, one country that once managed Hong Kong and Taiwan with China, or the reformed European Union as 33 systems and one union, nation states upgraded themselves in various ways to, by combining parts of the government with others that could serve mutual interest, even jointly sharing part of, parts of their territories with other states. Ended is the autocracy of nation state 
that exclusively dominates all of its territories and people within its bounds and exclu exclusions. With overlapping territories, moving territories from multiple and hybrid citizenships, the flex, flex states were able to release the periodic racial, economic, political tensions that built up within, certainly migrations became less dramatic and contentious. For Koreas, it was the time necessary to reconnect the people of two nations that have become completely different people after nearly a century of total separation. The border was still needed in order to protect the native culture and political systems and not to have the economy of North Korea ravaged like Russia did, Russia did under uh, Boris Yeltsin that produced oligarchies instead of democracies. And the governments of confederation of Koreas made valiant effort against South Korean uh, chevals to, from pillaging resources and labors of the North Korean people. And the success of the Confederation of Korea made possible for it to bring Russia, China, and Japan into Union of East Asia, with Peninsula acting as a strong ties to bind them together. It was the first time in human civilization where a peripheral state humbled the empires into peaceful cooperations. Thank you. so much for the invitation and for yeah, giving Kyung and me the opportunity to meet here in London. Um, we haven't met for a while, I guess, a few years, last time in Korea. Um, I think what's, what's interesting about the DMZ is um, that generally you could argue that borders are incredibly attractive question is a bit why and maybe because places like the DMZ are making politics and the conflicts of politics tangible, perceivable. Um, you can somehow touch politics, see politics and uh, I guess this makes them attractive so that you could see, for instance, here uh, in the internet or uh, in Seoul everywhere, um, basically advertisements for tours to the DMZ or here to the JSA, JSA uh, the Joint Security Area, where you have these blue barracks. And um, the question that I'm interested in here is, among others, somehow is what is the role of people like us, like architects, curators, uh, practi cultural practitioners in the wider sense, um, what are we doing exactly when we refer to politics and to conflicts? What are our tools and strategies and what is ultimately the impact we have on reality and Referring to the DMZ, what what is the real DMZ, which is the title of the exhibition program that was started by Sun Jung Kim um, a number of years ago. Um, in order to think about these questions, I would actually like to, first of all, before moving to the DMZ, starting with my first encounter with Korea, which was um, the Guangzhou Biennale. Uh, which was already mentioned by Kyung before. I was invited in 2013 by the Guangzhou Biennale to curate Guangzhou Folly, which is a format of, um, for public art to a certain extent. 
And uh, what I was fascinated by, which is, I think, um, close to the topic of the DMZ, um, is the, the high degree of politicization in Korea in public debate, but also referring um, closely to the Gwangju Biennale, because Gwangju Biennale's founding myth is the reference to the Gwangju uprising on May 18, 1980, and um, which ultimately led also to this, um, I think, fascinating um, object, which I found uh, somewhere in, in one of the main streets in Guangzhou, which documents the position or the naming of Guangzhou as, um, as uh, a UNESCO uh, World Heritage for um, democracy and human rights. Um, because it's probably one of the, um, yeah, on the long term, quite successful uh, uprisings, uh, which led somehow to the transition from a military dictatorship to a liberal democracy. Um, this became a bit of a, of a starting point for, for me to, uh, for the Guangzhou Folly project. And I will only show two projects which can, which somehow document also the position of artists and architects and how they can maybe deal with politics, with conflicts, and refer to conflicts. Um, one project, uh, here you see um, a photo from uh, May 18, uh, where basically uh, students, but also other parts of the population in, in Guangzhou were um, partly killed or put in prison um, by the police and the military uh, supported by um, US forces or CIA mainly. Um, the project involved a uh, around 10 artist groups, um, architects, artists, also writers in different combinations. Um, a strong reference, as I said, was the Guangzhou uprising, which was uh, quite directly um, used by Eyal Weizmann um, in his work, which uh, was called Roundabout Revolutions. Uh, he referred directly to this um, legendary photo of uh, this demonstration around the, the fountain in this, on this roundabout. And he contextualized this uh, revolution in Guangzhou with the revolutions that were um, happening around that time in the Arab region. So here, uh, the roundabout as a historic um, device actually for the control of people. It's quite, a, quite an irony to a certain extent that that planning device that was uh, introduced in order to organize people and to introduce law and order on the streets um, became suddenly a place of unrest. Uh, in Tunis, Tehran, Bahrain, Cairo and Ramallah. And uh, Eyal Weizmann documented this and um, also showed how roundabouts were deconstructed, like here in Bahrain. And he, um, he implemented these circles, the sizes of these roundabouts from different, many different places onto, the roundabout, on, onto a roundabout in front of the main station in Guangzhou. And combined this with the, uh, the moment that usually comes after the conflict, after the uprising the, or the revolution, which is uh, very often the round table where conflicts are debated and eventually some kind of consensus um, arranged. So he, he built a, a small pavilion with a round table where um, a number of NGOs, because um, this is also something I learned that in Korea there are many activists, NGOs that um, partly introduce very fierce debates into the public realm. And uh, this table and pavilion was meant to become a, 
a place for uh, debates. And um, what was interesting, the several days before the opening, um, there was actually a protest uh, by a teachers' union happening place uh, right on this roundabout. So people uh, seem to have understood uh, some of the intentions, although um, it's quite obvious that you cannot plan conflict. And this was also not, not the intention. Um, the other um, attempt that I, or the other project that I want to sh quickly show before moving on to the DMZ is a project by Ram Kohlhaas, the, uh, the Dutch architect, and the uh, writer Ingo Niemann from, um, from Germany. And they um, probably had a slightly less um, activist approach to public debate. Um, they were quite interested in the uh, in the question of the plebiscite, like question of participation of people in public debate, and they uh, came up with this object in in a street in downtown Guangzhou, which is, uh, which is a kind of gate where on the top there is uh, a question. Um, the very first question was, do you support democracy? Uh, the next one was uh, questioning or asking people about their position vis-a-vis -vis plastic surgery, big topic in Korea. And um, this was, all the projects were done in collaboration with NGOs, so there was an NGO um, preparing these questions or taking up questions that were uh, sent to them. And uh, these questions were then shown over um, around three weeks. And we had these three lanes, um, the, the red one, no, the one in the middle, maybe, and the green one, yes. And um, the whole thing was recorded by, the, by a CCTV camera, and so it was basically a plebiscite, a daily plebiscite over three weeks by your feet. And of course, it's a plebiscite that can easily be manipulate, manipulated by just walking several times through it, or you don't watch the lanes and just walk where you walk. So it's, it's kind of um, instrument that also shows the, the contradictions when we talk about votes, about participation, uh, as a tool that can easily be manipulated. And, um, and I think this, this was uh, a highly debated intervention in, in Guangzhou. Um, from there, um, yes, a few shots. Yeah, this was then also tracked and um, communicated online on the website. And from there, moving on to the DMZ. So I was, um, during that time at, in Guangzhou, I was uh, spending a lot of time in, in Korea and, and was invited to the DMZ by Sun Jung Kim to co-curate uh, this edition, and it's, uh, it's an ongoing um, project, actually. So uh, a couple of things that you have seen before in, in Kyung's presentation. I think what's interesting is maybe that the DMZ is, um, it's, of course, a line, like an abstract line, but it's, it's a zone. It has uh, around, th um, I think, a depth around yeah, two kilometers in, in both directions from that theoretical line. So it's a four kilometer wide strip that runs uh, throughout the whole peninsula. And besides, on both sides of the, of the DMZ, there's a, the so-called civil control line. So it's a kind of buffer zone. So the whole project that we did, it's an it's a in situ project. So the project didn't happen in the DMZ because you don't have access to the DMZ unless you are uh, one of these poor soldiers who have to do patrols there or uh, unless you are a Swiss or Swedish 
soldier, they have some access in particular areas in the zone. But our um, intervention happened in this, um, within this buffer zone on the southern side. It's a zone where you need a special permit to get into, and, and it's a very particular political situation, ecological situation, and also social pol uh, and economic pol position for the people who live there. So, of course, there's a fascination, as I said before, uh, for um, an area where there's a conflict that's highly mediatized. Um, we see constantly maneuvers and we see uh, politicians debating about it. And we see uh, on TV uh, amazing images produced by the likes of Kim Jong-un or Donald Trump. Uh, or we, we are tourists like me here in, a, in this, uh, one of these famous blue barracks. Um, where you always have these uh, hardcore, uh, very stiff soldiers um, with sunglasses. And there is, I think, one of the main features are actually the binoculars. And because there is an expectation you do, it's probably one of the main um, tourist spots in Korea. Um, there is something I would called a uh, tourism, it's, it's almost like a dark tourism, where you look for conflict. The problem though is you don't see it, you don't see it. you don't see much. Uh, and I remember I've been there with many artists, um, basically for a research trip, looking for a, a site of intervention for their work. And what was typical is in a way the, also the disappointment that the mediatized images that everybody has in his or her mind, you don't see them. Yeah, you don't. You, of course, you see soldiers, a lot of soldiers, but you don't see weapons. You don't see uh, guns, uh, no explosion whatsoever. It's it's incredibly calm there, and you see um, the other side. You see here, um, it's not very visible, but you see a huge uh, North Korean flag um, on the other side. But you. See, you see this green strip of the DMZ. But it's, it's of course, nothing new, the, this dark tourism. Here's a shot from the Berlin Wall. And, of course, West Berlin was a major tourist spot because of the wall. And also the, the special cultural scene in West Berlin in the 60s and 70s and early 80s was probably a result of this special um, political biotope created by the wall. So this is actually a view from East, East Berlin to the West. Because these towers were of course also only positioned on the western side. And something similar we see now in the, at the DMZ here. Uh, um, here we are in a, on a research trip with, with artist Carsten Höller, who, as you might know, is a, um, he's known for his sculptures a lot, but also he's, um, he's, he has a PhD in, in uh, biology speci specialized on birds. So he has done a lot of work on birds. And um, this shows quite literally um, that one of the main attractions of the DMZ area is actually the, the bird sanctuary. So the, the nature there where you basically, as a, as a visitor, you have to hide, you have to be uh, incredibly silent, and you watch the birds. So there are, there are professional photographers or um, biologists who watch the birds for hours, and we were only there for one hour, approximately. So it became a spot where a lot of birds land on their ways, uh, like in, in the winter or after the winter, from um, coming from Siberia mainly. So um, just to give you an impression of our 
um, work and the kind of artists we invited and how they reacted to these um, to these different spots. It's of course we it's important to say that we focus on a particular area, so not on the whole strip. We focused on the area around uh, a small city called Chabon, and. Um, that region is relatively small, yet our interventions were partly very much uh, separated. So it's important yet to mention that in order to visit this place, it's not like a public art event in London. It's, it's something that has to be organized because you need uh, a permit to get into the zone and it has to start somewhere. So everything uh, started with a bus tour. This is the format, actually, of these visits. So you do, we somehow copied or mimicked the typical tourist bus tour, only that we picked up people at a museum in, in, uh, in Seoul and then took a, took a bus on the, um, which then took the road to the DMZ uh, in the direction to, to Trevon. And the bus tour took probably around uh, 60 to 90, min 90 minutes, and which is quite a long time. Uh, so we also used it for performances as part of the DMZ project. And here we see Minuk Lim, um, who um, did a performance called Monument 300, Chasing Watermarks. Uh, it's referring to uh, a number of killings of people from the area around the DMZ um, whose bodies were found in water tanks. So it's, there are still a lot of unknown histories uh, and atrocities of uh, people who were killed either by the Northern Army uh, or the Southern Army So because the front was going back and forth. Uh, I think it's, um, also, I think it's important to keep in mind that the Korean War was um, incredibly dynamic, where the Northern Army, together with the Chinese, actually pushed very much into the South, and, the, and then there was a rollback. And I think b between these movements, a lot of people were, were killed or were blamed as traitors or as collaborators of uh, one or the other army. And Minok Glim in, in a lot of her work, refers to these stories. And uh, she did uh, hear a performance, a, a reading, which uh, was then also continued on site. A similar um, performance was uh, a reading by um, a text by German writer Ingo Niemann, who I mentioned before, also in this uh, Ram Kulhas project. Um, we had sent him or offered him a trip first to North Korea because we found it interesting or important that we have some artists who actually would see the DMZ from both sides, which is um, an opportunity that no South Korean can actually have. They're not allowed to, or usually not allowed to travel to the North. And Ingo Niemann uh, basically watched the um, the, the DMZ from the north and from the south, and of course he heard um, actually quite similar stories as he tells in his book. So we, uh, his his work and contribution to the project was the commission of a book. Um, um, it's called Drill Nation Korea, where he, among others, also makes a proposal for the DMZ, which he called the demechanized zone, which um, somehow as a starting point um, says the following, I quote, the first time I visited South Korea in 2012, my driver immediately asked me, you are from Germany, right? So what do you think about German reunification? The question came as no surprise. I had already heard that the German example had bolstered many South Korean skepticism about Korean reunification. No wonder, with the argument that people from formerly socialist East Germany would otherwise migrate en masse 
to West Germany, wages in the East were raised to largely equal those in the West, despite significantly lower productivity. So it makes this whole argument uh, of yeah, a certain skepticism vis-a-vis -vis reunification. And then um, he, he talks about somehow a scenario where North, North and South Korea would actually through a process of simplification and downsizing, meet on, on a kind of equal level. So it's this, this total demechanization, as Ingo Niemann calls it, where North Korean people would actually don't feel inferior to, to the skilled and, and rather rich South Koreans. They would actually both inhabit the DMZ in a in an economic and technologically downsized version. That's his scenario for the DMZ. Here we see Ingo Niemann in Pyongyang. Yeah, this is how you enter the buffer zone and pass the civ uh, the civilian control line. And here again, binoculars. Uh, this is um, in this area around Chewon, um, like in many spots around uh, along the DMZ, you would find, find uh, observatories. They usually get then the name Peace Observatory. So the word Peace and DMZ appears everywhere along the along that line. So there are DMZ marathons, there are DMZ uh, music festivals, and so on. So here again, you see this uh, green wilderness. But it usually uh, ends with some disappointment because you don't see much. It's also a kind of obligatory tour for many soldiers. And this became uh, also a starting point for Thomas Saraceno, who you see here with his binocular. And he, um, he was quite fascinated actually that the, uh, by this kind of empty view to the north where you don't see much and here, and, but usually a binocular, when you see it in these spots, it's actually fixed into one direction. You can turn it to some degree, but it, it's, it cannot move around 360 degree. So his only intervention was actually to uh, make it possible that you can move the binocular backwards. So it's a 360 degree binocular where you can turn it vis-a-vis uh, -vis the audience. So you have uh, usually a lot of audience here in these places. Then uh, very close to the to the observatory, you have the, a big plaza, the Peace Plaza, in front of the of the Peace Hall, which is usually totally empty. And here you see an intervention by a Korean artist based in London, Ko Jong Ah, with these um, somehow combining that um, very slick and modern plaza with very old stones, uh, volcanic stones from the area, which somehow refer to a different era. You see the Peace Plaza in the back. In Peace Plaza, in, in, or in the building, Peace Hall, sorry for the frequent use of the word peace, but it's um, it's, it's interesting then that in the, in the reference with the DMZ, uh, the demilitarized zone, the word peace is so constantly reused that it becomes uh, totally redundant. Here we uh, were showing a film um, by Vietnamese artist Dinh Hieu Lee, who um, is in his work um, linking three countries very often that were actually divided in the past decades. Uh, one is Vietnam, 
the other one Korea and the third one is Germany. So he uh, shot a trilogy about these places and here in the show we were focusing on Korea. He did interviews with uh, children in school and asking them about the division and about um, a possible reunification. And it was obvious that the, that the children repeated um, a number of cliches about, because these were interviews with South Korean children, certain cliches about the North, and somehow reflecting exactly what Ingo Niemann told about uh, the angst of West Germans vis-a-vis -vis -vis East Germans, uh, like taking their money, etc. So it was mainly it's interesting with five years year old children, it was mainly about economy, the discourse. So quite a really interesting piece. Uh, then a piece by, uh, also a, a video by Mark Lewis um, about a viewing point from one of these hills where you had fierce battles um, between the US Army and the communist armies. And this is more also about, again, um, somehow tourism or military tourism um, where you have guided tours. So you see maybe a little bit here um, a group of tourists standing on, uh, on the star, with, which is a military symbol. Again, you see mainly agriculture and nature when you look from there into the landscape. Then, um, time over, almost. Um, I run very quickly through that. Um, so here we are um, seeing now the third location maybe, so the first one being the bus, the second one uh, the observatory with the Peace Plaza around it, and the third one is a small village um, called Yangjiri. Um, probably important to mention that this buffer zone is not empty. Of course there are soldiers, that's one thing, then um, a lot of nature, but there's also agriculture, many rice fields primarily. So there are a number of villages there in this buffer zone, so behind a certain border. And they were um, inserted or started as propaganda villages in the 1960s. So former soldiers were given land and a house in these uh, villages. And um, now the population is aging. There are this, uh, I think the average is really in, the, in maybe 74 or 75. And here, um, every uh, by law, every village uh, needs an atomic bunker. Here we did a, a sound installation by sound artist Florian Hecker. You see instructions what to do in the case of, of an atomic bomb. And here you see the sound in installation um, in this bunker. We had an, another performance then by Korean cello player Ok Jung Lee in, in a former rice mill of this small uh, village. So you see that a lot of the infrastructure of these communities of, is falling apart. And then um, as another example, um, there's a work by Adrian Villarojas, um, the Argentinian artist, um, we might also know he had a big show at the Serpentine a few years ago. And uh, he was shooting a film, but also uh, spending a lot of time um, in this small village, very remote, because it's really in a buffer zone. He was there with a team of four assistants, and they had really lived there, uh, which was, of course, a very special situation which was also interesting for us to understand to what extent can artists or cultural practice in general interact with a highly politicized situation in, uh, in, a, in the form of a residency. So it was the classic form of, a, of an artist residency in the buffer zone. 
so they used particular um, tactics, so they, they organized dinners, and uh, of course there was a huge language barrier. This was the residency, so, so one of the um, typical houses there and in a small atelier next to it. They had an outdoor studio where they produced um, small cultural works. Adrian Villarrojas works a lot also with vegetables and incorporates them into um, small sculptures, which you see here, for instance. <coughs> which was then also incorporated in the, f in the, in the video. And uh, a number of years ago, he also, Adrian also started with these clay sculptures, and these were produced also as little gifts to inhabitants where they had dinner or invitations. So here you see, for instance, one as part of this very modest furniture in these private houses. And this is a scene from, from the film. This as well. And this is maybe the last image I'm, I'm showing. Um, maybe, maybe one word um, again to Adrian Villarrojas and his team. Um, I guess what, what's interesting in, in site-specific work is, of course, the, the, um, there is a certain promise that you would do, that you would contribute to an existing culture, to a political situation. Uh, yet, of course, it's always a promise that you cannot fulfill, because what would be the goal here? And uh, to a certain extent, uh, I feel it's important to also introduce a moment of decontextualization. And this is something that, with which the, the, artist, um, the artists in general, but maybe Adrian Villarrojas in specifically, um, he, he, he dealt a lot with, with that element of decontextualization and of maybe also the liberty you can take sometimes as an artist. Um, to have a different view or to insert something in order to create a different situation. And, and this is uh, maybe the last image, which is uh, just an example of how we uh, will continue the project, because we have been working now a number of years in, this, in these villages, in this particular border area, but we will now broaden the situation and will work along the whole strip of the DMZ with site-specific work. Part of yeah, some of these works will be permanent and also a bit larger. And this is um, a glimpse to one of these works. It's a building by artist Tobias Rehberger. And it's a double house or twin house for a North Korean family and a South Korean family. Um, the, the North Korean part will be empty until unification happens. So, and in, in, the, uh, in the other part, uh, a family will, will move in. It's a project that we hope to, to build next year. And um, it's, it's somehow trying to, to use function, to, to invent a program to speculate uh, or to introduce a, a moment of speculation vis-a-vis -vis the future of the DMZ. Thank you. Right. So, uh, so my question is, I mean, actually the, this image here reminds me of a funny story about, I had a friend, uh, uh, architect actually, a uh, Dan Danish architect who, had a three-story house or something typical, maybe Dutch style, Danish style. And uh, he, him and his uh, wife, uh, they, they didn't get along. They ended up getting divorced. So what they did is that they put a wall straight up through the three-story of the building, divide the house into half, had a one hole where kids go coop one side or the other. So this reminds me of that. Okay, <laughs> so all right. Going back is that, that okay? 
what is real DMZ, right? That's a very good question. And actually, I never went to DMZ because I thought that people who went to DMZ were completely ridiculous, you know. Uh, because DMZ, if you think about the problems of division between Korea, uh, two Koreas, uh, the problems or the solution, none of those things exist in the DMZ. It exists everywhere else but there. In other words, problem is entirely outside of DMC, right? So, uh, and and the question becomes is also how thick is the border, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, border is in theory uh, almost non-existent line, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, it is just an idea abstraction. There is no, but in this case, there is actually a physical border, and. Uh, so, I mean, what do you see when you go there, right? Are you searching for the real DMZ? You go there, you see all these, uh, I mean, I saw that one uh, telescope uh, 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 lens is even camouflaged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, to me, it seems like, you know, is that people, uh, they don't really see anything there, right, as we, you, you, you said. I think people actually already bring what they want to see in their mind before they get there. And they're actually, the sighting is going the other direction. It's not that something is coming to you, into your eyes, but your eyes are actually projecting out there that you want to see. So that actually happened to me. Hmm. The only time that I went to DMZ is actually because of you. I went to see the show. Hmm. You know, and I got on the bus with all the other people who were invited, mm -hmm. and I went there, uh, uh, and and I went to the same place which you actually took a picture, mm -hmm. which we were not allowed to take picture. But how yeah. did you take the picture? Because you're not Korean, yeah, right? Probably. Um, yeah. You know, and and that also reminds me. I'm going round and round because I want to say so many things. It's it's only the Koreans who cannot go to North Korea. It's only the Koreans who cannot go to South Korea. Everybody else actually can go either North or South Korea, okay? Mm. So it kind of reminds me of that, how mm. you took that picture. So um, so my question, oh, yeah, I, this is not questioned anymore, right? Uh, I'm wondering. Yeah, 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 it's coming. Just give me a few seconds. So I went to DMZ, and in fact, at the exact place where you took that picture, you out the window, you see the, landscape, and I actually projected what I wanted to see, mm. which was that what I saw was nothing about North and South Korea. Mm. I saw a landscape. In fact, that day was so clear that the people worked there. They say it's one of the most clearest day mm. uh, ever. And I could see very far into this kind of like valley-like landscape. Everything was really green because it was the summer. and. Um, I saw nothing, uh, nothing that is man-made or anything mm. like that. And what I saw was that I saw, I saw something like thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousand years ago. What I saw was uh, past. I saw time. Basically, I was looking at time, not space. First time I ever saw a time instead of space, I mm -hmm. felt. Mm -hmm. And it was just incredible feeling. And uh, that's what made me very special, mm -hmm. but it had really nothing to do with DMC or the division of North, Korea, North and South, uh, or division of Korea into mm -hmm. two parts. So did you really discover what is the real DMC, and what oh. did you really see there? Well, of, of course, I haven't discovered uh, the real DMZ, but I guess the title of that exhibition series r refers maybe to the question, what is there beyond the obvious but slightly difficult um, or unperceivable political conflict? So I think what you have seen, for instance, the, the much older natural history, of that place is something that we were interested in. These are the realities um, that we were interested in. Agriculture also. I think this is, for instance, the interest in this little village 
um, is is also because we were interested. What, what does it mean to live in a buffer zone? My God, in a propaganda village. Yeah, they, they even invented, at, at least this is a story, um, a particular housing typology. Usually the, the small farming houses, there are um, one family only, and they're usually directed, um, apparently in Korea, towards the south, uh, towards the north, yeah, with a door in the north. People told me, I'm not mm. sure whether this is true or not. But apparently here, and that's in the, in the buffer zone, all the doors are turned away from the northern border. To escape. Yeah, to escape <laughs> for whatever reason. And they, they're always, they were always putting two families into one house or adjacent. And the motive for this apparently was also that was maybe to introduce a moment of control. So they would also control each other. Spy so, on each other? Yeah. Well, that's what that's certain what, people that's said. North it's it's maybe all... Uh, uh, might not be true, but it's, it's interesting that they introduced new typologies. Yeah, and it, these, this is not just a vernacular building. This is, has clearly been planned in the 1960s. Some kind so, of so social experiment. Yeah. And and now uh, most of the villages are really old. They, they st some of them still work on the on the fields, and it's but it's dying. Yeah, it's like it's it's a, it's people with with kids. They they have to move out because there are there are some kindergartens, but less and less. The, we saw a number of ruins of schools, so it's 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 quite an unsustainable uh, but society that's not, there. But that's not really just the DMC part problem, it's the whole country. The, the whole country. Is but of course the, there is no there's economy. There's only people living in the countryside now, yeah. And so there is no um, economy because there is, this is a bit apart from the big industrial centers. So what's, what's, the, what's the future for this area? And this is where the, 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 this frequent use of uh, of the words peace and DMZ becomes very obvious. This this is for this is tourism. Yeah, so and it's a kind of dark or disaster tourism um, or war tourism, which is certainly not it's nothing new. Yeah, we, I guess uh, tourists are attracted by the Colosseum in, in Rome, which was basically a, a place for atrocities that we cannot imagine. So I think there is also in our um, yeah, society of, of spectacles, there is a certain tendency to, to go to these places. Mm -hmm. And Korea is also, uh, don't understand me wrong, it's a, I'm, I'm a big fan of Korea, but it's not a place where you would find a lot of old houses or so. That this country has been really destroyed through, through, the, through many wars, not only the civil war in the, in the 50s, but uh, before uh, by the Japanese also, I think there has been really waves of destruction. Or the Americans bombing. And Americans <laughs> bombing. So, Which, so yeah. there is maybe, there are no, no real hot spots for tourism that you find in the cities. Uh, so I don't man, mean this as an insult, but I think this is how I perceived uh, Guangzhou and many other cities. Um, so maybe the main tourist attraction is the border. Okay. And and this is why I'm. I think it's interesting to look for um, the other realities, mm -hmm. which are, for instance, tourists who don't. There are some tourists who don't come. Um, for the border or the, the military presence, they they come for the birds, which is of course a result of this um, cold war in that situation or frozen war, and um, and I think this this frozen zone where nothing happens um, actually created something mm -hmm. like an, an incredible nature. 
That's interesting. So, but, but I think the, what, 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 now I come with a question. Yeah, that's what I was waiting um, for your question, yeah. Because coming from reality, um, because this is maybe one focus um, to another element, which I think is quite strong in, in Project DMZ, is fiction. Section? Fiction. Fiction. Oh. Fiction. Uh, because Virilio's project and, and others, they're very fictional, which I, I think it's, it's fantastic, really. And it's, and because I, I think there's an interesting tension between um, realism as a certain approach and, on the other hand, fiction, where you fictionalize the reality or a given situation. Right. right. And, and I think this can raise some or introduce really a, um, really interesting speculations and, and I was just reminded of since this was uh, more or less 30 years ago the, when the Berlin Wall um, came down and it's basically it happened by a misunderstanding almost like a fiction mm -hmm. yeah, because someone in a press conference uh, a politician he I think his choice of words wasn't adequate to what he, I think he was confused and he uh, fictionalized something it was and, and I think this is interesting well, he was confused. I, 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 would, I wouldn't yeah, say yeah. that this was an, was an art piece what he was doing but it was clearly a performance that went wrong and produced uh, incredible things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and because it's so easy to to dismiss uh, artistic interventions in, in, a, in, a, in such a loaded political situation because, well, it's, are these just artistic jokes or serious jokes, but highly irrelevant to a political situation, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe fiction has, a, has also a role well, in these, politics. Yeah, these days, because of the fake news by Donald Trump that we have to assume that everything is supposed to be fake is actually true now, <laughs> right? Mm. And uh, yes, I mean, uh, the, uh, I think part of it how maybe uh, what you're as suggesting or asking me is that, that uh, part of the uh, DMC or, or a large part or even more than majority of it is really fiction no view of our, uh, uh, projecting from us, ourselves, you know, right? So the reality of it is rather uh, kind of cornered somewhere, mm -hmm. invisible. But I think that, that that's, uh, for me, I think that um, the reality is really scary as hell to me, right? Because for, uh, um, um, how can I put it? Um, I mentioned something about what the current situation is very much like uh, at the, the end of Joseon Dynasty or so-called brief period of the Korean Empire. I don't know why they call it you know, empire because Korea is so small, right? Never been an empire, right? But this was a transition you know, at the end of Joseon Dynasty. Anyway, that the real fight struggle was that uh, one side of the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the last king and uh, his uh, uh, empress and the, the, the I call it viceroy or something, that there was a, a struggle between their political power uh, in the old-fashioned court you know, sense, right? And uh, between kings, queens, and uh, the, the regents and Etc. Uh, alliance one is aligned with China, the other is aligned with Japan, mm -hmm. and then the king kind of like escapes into security of Russian embassies and so forth. And so today it feels very much the same that uh, that there is the potential of the that Korea becomes. Uh, the site again for battlefield between these empires. Because by the way, Korea only shares border with empires. We don't share borders with any smaller country than ourselves. 
China, Japan, and Russia. And then, you know, basically Japan is just a part of the United States, right? We all can agree with that, right? And uh, so, <clears throat> so why do I think about this? Yeah, you know, I love to like live in Korea instead of living in the evil empire of the United States. But uh, unfortunately, I can't do that right now. But uh, uh, so I, I tell you why I think about this way, because I went to a, 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 a lecture at my school, which has a very big international relation uh, school in it, my university. And uh, one of the uh, uh, leading professor is very much into Korea studies and et cetera. So he threw like a bunch of uh, series of lectures about North Korea, uh, about a couple of years ago, I think, and 2017. One of it was titled DP, uh, DPRK and Trump. Well, you know, that was a very good title. It drew a lot of people, like 350 people. And most of them were not students. So. Uh, who came to it, and a one hour, 45 minutes presentation by four retired former mid-level, upper, maybe upper level CIA guy, and kind of went through the whole history of the uh, nuclear problem between United States and North Korea, right? And uh, then there were a lot of questions, and uh, I realized at that point, and one hour, 45 minutes I was there, not once the speaker or anyone else then used the word South Korea. Okay. Basically, in that room, South Korea is doesn't exist. It's irrelevant. You know. And by the way, Seoul is now, according to Wikipedia, fourth largest economic uh, core in the world probably after New York, London, Tokyo, and then I think it running neck neck with Los Angeles area. And the US military strategies, that means nothing. They can destroy that place like anywhere else in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, elsewhere, right? So that's why I start to feel that we're back into end of Joseon dynasty. The, the, the global struggle between Russia, China, and the United States, you know, uh, overplayed again. And uh, so uh, I got really worried, you know. So I think somewhere behind it is the reality. On this phone, as one speaker, I forget, mentioned once, mm -hmm. speaking in Budapest to some 20-year-old people, five things in here from the military, right? GPS, touch screen, the micro camera lenses, uh, what, oh, the, the microprocessor, and uh, the uh, locator guidance system, right? For missiles. We're carrying this silent things in our pocket. Mm. In here is some of the greatest invention that gave the most powerful weapons to kill people, right? And considering how pathetic, and you used the other word was that, uh, about Trump and Kim Jong-un. Uh, that was another word that was, no, not with that, even more kind of like sadistic, I can't remember. Hmm. Leaderships throughout the world, so I cannot imagine anything that would be, uh, any separation between the fiction and reality anymore. Right. That's how I would, how I, I would answer. I think that's also the, the impression when you, because we were both saying that you don't see much actually at the border, but because of not seeing much or anything, you can also imagine all the atrocities. It's, 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 it's somehow a typical sign of what was used to be called a, a cold war. It's, it's something you don't see. Mm -hmm. I think that's now maybe the moment to where we yeah, should yeah. also give the time uh, open to the floor.